We want to talk today on the power and blessings of unity. Consider for a moment the power of unity that is stated in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 30. One shall chase a thousand, but two shall put ten thousand to flight. Tremendous power when two people are working together in harmony rather than having differences. One shall put a thousand to flight, but two shall put ten thousand to flight. And then Jesus stated in Matthew 18 verse 19, if two of you shall agree, it shall be done for them of my Father that's in heaven. Well, let's go back to the beginning in Genesis 11, verse 6. After the flood, when mankind was multiplying, the people had one language and one purpose, and this is what the Lord had to say. Now nothing will be restrained from them that they've imagined to do. But they were using their combined unity for evil. So God had to separate the languages and the nationalities. The power of unity for good or evil. Even the 12 apostles, when they were younger, didn't have perfect unity. There was competition among them constantly arguing who is going to be the greatest. And even at the Last Supper around the communion table, they were arguing who is going to be the greatest. Listen to Luke 22, verse 24. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. You know, that for three years the Lord constantly had said to these 12 apostles, if you want to be great, learn to be the servant of all. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. Humility, friends, is the key to unity. Putting others first, esteeming others better than ourselves, honoring others before ourselves. Humility is the key to unity. Now, God understands the tremendous power of unity, but so also does Satan, and that's why he is seeking to divide and conquer. And his central target is against the home and marriage. Unity in the church begins with unity at home. The church is simply a collection of homes, of families. Unity is a very close message to the heart of God. When we read in the last two verses of the Old Testament in Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6, in our days the Lord is going to send Elijah the prophet to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers. You see, it starts at home. Remember what Christ said, that every house divided against itself will not stand. Matthew 12, verse 25. It'd be good to write down these scriptures. Many of today's problems go back to the home. God wants to visit our homes. The movings of the Holy Spirit are limited in the church because of conditions that exist in its families. Hard feelings and personal problems block up our wells. Faith doesn't flow because of it. So how are things at home? If we are not growing Spiritually, we will not grow in our marriage and in our relationships with others. To grow spiritually means we are becoming more and more like the Lord. Growing spiritually means we are growing in all the fruits of the Spirit. Peace, long-suffering, and love and joy and forbearance and all these other attributes of God. But all of these things uh, produce 
a better relationship with each other and in marriage. So may I say that, uh, that unity in the church <clears throat> doesn't only begin at home or in a couple. It literally begins in the individual. So we want to talk about four different levels of unity. Christ prayed for unity among his brethren in John 17, verse 21 to 23. In verse 23, he prayed that they may be made perfect in one, implying that perfection is the only is only possible by coming to unity and having right relationships with each other. But disunity reveals unresolved problems in the heart. These are issues that God wants to deal with in our hearts. Christianity actually revolves around two basic things in life. Our relationship with God and with people. So Christianity is all about relationships. Well, for a few moments, let's talk about four different levels of unity. First of all, <clears throat> it begins in the individual heart. When we read Psalm 86, verse 11, David prayed something. Unite my heart, Lord, to fear and reverence your name. He prayed for a united heart because there were some affections in his heart that were divided. He was a man after God's own heart, but then he was lusting after another woman, etc. Unity does not begin in a body of people, it begins, or it doesn't even begin in a couple. Unity begins in the individual heart. We can't hope to get along with others if we can't even get along with ourselves, if we have no peace in our own heart. No man can serve two masters. Well, all strife within ourselves needs to cease. We need to be at peace with ourselves before we can proper, properly love and flow with other people. So we need to pray, number one, Lord, unite my heart. Give me peace in my heart. No divided heart. May I be wholehearted for you, Lord, and have great peace. In the book of James 4, verse 1, there's a question. From whence come wars and fightings among you, among Christians? Come they not hence even from the lusts that were in your members? Unresolved things in the heart. Fightings, wars, arguments that go on among ourselves. Where do they come from? They come from struggles that exist in our own hearts that God wants to settle. So how do we get over these battles and come to unfeigned love for the brethren? First Peter 1.22 gives us a good answer. Every time we obey the truth there is a transformation in our lives. Uh, there can be no genuine love or unity until there's been a response to the truth, a response to something God is putting his finger on in our life. The problem is not every Christian is willing to fully respond to the truth. This is the reason I believe not, not everyone in the church is going to come to unity but only the bride, a wonderful spiritual group within the church who are fully surrendered. <clears throat> so unity number one begins in the individual. Lord, unite my heart to fear thy name. Number two, we come to another level of unity. It's called the unity of the spirit that we read in Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 3. So after gaining victory, a measure, at least a measure of victory in our own personal lives, we come to a second level of unity, the unity of the Spirit. 
Now, we're talking about being able to worship together with different denominations and so forth. In the past decades in the charismatic movement, many denominations came together to worship, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to demonstrate the gifts of the Spirit. People from every denomination joined together to thank God and worship. This was progress. It was something that many thought could never happen. This is an example of the unity of the Spirit. Different denominations all worshiping together. But something major was still missing. They could worship as one, but when you mention doctrine or beliefs, there was still not a lot of harmony. And this is the reason we need to come to the third aspect of unity, the unity of the faith. And we read this in Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. The unity of the faith, common beliefs, the same thinking, the same foundation. So, the unity of the common faith requires a higher degree of maturity than the unity of the Spirit. It's one thing to be able to praise the Lord together, different denominations, but to have the same thinking. That requires a deeper work of the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> we need to agree together in the common beliefs. The unity of the faith is the ability to have the same views on the major truths of Scripture. So that means there needs to be a surrender of some of our opinions. I think the greatest enemy of unity is our natural mind. Walls that divide people are located in the mind, our thinking, in our heart. So when it comes to the issues of the day, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a big variety of opinions like we do. He only has one thing to say. And we need the unity of the Spirit and the unity of the faith. So we can see that uh, often our minds get in the way and, and block unity. Are we willing to allow God to change our thinking? Even if it goes against some of our traditions and the way we were brought up. You know, sometimes people are willing to die for their beliefs, but we need to be sure that we're suffering for the right cause, not our own. So it's going to take the fivefold ministry in our days to bring the church to unity. And God is restoring these five ministries to the church for the perfecting of the saints, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 12 and 13. So we need the fivefold ministry to give us one mind. So in particular, the teaching ministry needs uh, to help us to have oneness of mind in these last days. So God is not going to use us tre tremendously in these last days if we don't have a surrendered mind and opinions. But also if I could say this, truth does bring division. It separates the sheep from the goats, the holy from the unholy. It divides soul and spirit. And some people don't want to be holy, and this is the reason not all Christians are going to come to unity. Unity, a clear mind, belong to the holy. The pure in heart shall see as God sees, Matthew 5, 8. So, listen to John 7, verse 17. If any man is willing to do God's will, he will know the doctrine. You see, this is a surrendered heart. If any man is willing to do God's will, he will know the doctrine. John 7, verse 17. 
Well, let's come to the fourth level of unity. And this is called the unity of the brethren. And there's a beautiful uh, three passages here in Psalm 133, the first three verses. This is unity on a large scale, the unity of the brethren. Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Oh, listen to the blessings. I'm going to read this, Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. They went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Listen, in unity, this is where the Lord commands the blessing. And so we want to have this anointing. Now, this anointing that I'm reading from, this anointing that ran down upon Aaron, this particular anointing, we want to look briefly at the ingredients of it. So, because they have spiritual meanings. So this wonderful unity is likened to the precious anointing oil that ran down Aaron's beard and his garments. So to appreciate the meaning of this special anointing, it's necessary to study the ingredients that compose this anointing and their spiritual meanings. This is found in Exodus 30, verse 22 to 25. And we will look at these. But before we do, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, there are nine herbs mentioned. And these nine herbs correspond to the nine fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. Love is likened to pomegranates, joy to camphor, peace to spikenard, long-suffering to saffron, gentleness to calamus, goodness to cinnamon, faith, frankincense, meekness, myrrh, temperance, aloes. So the nine herbs mentioned in the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, correspond to the nine fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So having this in mind, let's find the interpretation and in several key ingredients that made up this special anointing of unity in Exodus 30. Myrrh speaks of meekness. Sweet cinnamon speaks of goodness. Calamus is gentleness. Cassia represents tears. Olive oil speaks of peace. But these are the, th the things that are necessary for unity. It's like the anointing that ran down upon Aaron and his garments. We need these things. These are the components of the precious anointing that brings unity. Meekness, goodness, gentleness, tears, peace, brokenness, humility, mellowness, compassion, understanding. These all compose unity. But if I could say this in one word, humility is the key to unity. So, this is maturity, when the brethren of the Lord can flow together in this level of unity and compassion and unselfishness for each other. This is where the Lord commands the blessing, even life forevermore. This is the ultimate of Christianity. Now listen to, to Colossians 3, verse 14. Love is the bond of perfectness. Love is the source of unity. 
the bond of perfectness. So, love, loving our brethren, that's unity. Most of the commandments in God's word involve our treatment of other people. How we treat people is the way we treat God. As you've done this to others, you've done it to me, the Lord says. Read Matthew 7, 13. And then Matthew 25, verse 34 and 35. As you have done this to other people, you've done it to me, the Lord says. So we need to love our brother and sister. And in doing that, we're loving God. And this is what leads to unity. Right relationships. Yes, all scripture focuses upon our relationship with others and with God. So we need a new, soft heart. God made provision in his new covenant. Remember in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, and then in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 27, the Lord said, I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm going to give you a new heart of flesh. I'm going to take away your stony heart. This is the key to coming to unity. Character is actually the most important thing in life. This is what we take with us when we leave this life. So, who we are, our character, is the sum total of life's choices and decisions. Godly character is produced in us as we choose to do what is right when we're under pressure. This is especially true concerning our relationships with each other. Humility, having unity, having all the fruit of the Spirit developed in us. More and more we come to greater and greater unity. So God is going to give us grace, divine enablement in our time of need if we're willing to receive it. Not everyone receives the grace of God. They harden their hearts. You know, in spite of all the problems of the young Corinthian believers, Paul knew that if they, continue, if they would continue to yield to the Lord, they could become blameless and without spot. And you, it would be good to read 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8 and Jude 1 24. He's able to keep us from falling and to present us blameless. In Colossians 1, verse 22 and 23. So again, friends, we want the <laughs> blessings of unity. And as the fruit of the Spirit is developed in us, we will come to this. God bless you abundantly.